Hey, what's up guys? It's Tuesday and uh, this is the video for Bio 1-2. Um, today's topic is uh, going to be the second to last that we do uh, in this evolution unit and that is on the topic of speciation. Um, now this is the first time we're doing this so I am going to have you guys uh, take notes in your notebook. Uh, you know normally I would write this all on the board so um, I'm going to be giving it to you as a PowerPoint. Now um, obviously this is going to be a lot faster than if I were writing this on the board and so what you can just do while you're listening to this is uh, as I you know show the the points the bullet points show up um, just go ahead and pause the video and just copy down those notes um, and uh, feel free if I'm like elaborating or giving you examples uh, feel free to add more to your notes but uh, at minimum for this assignment um, which is worth 10 points uh, you are going to just write down the stuff that I give you. So let's go ahead and start. Oh, I guess this thing shows up here. It's my first one ever. So let's see how this goes. So uh, let's just quickly recap what we have been talking about um, in our class. And uh, and that's on the topic of evolution. So uh, the first point, the first lecture we went over was uh, how evolution happens through the process of natural selection. Um, you guys should be pretty good on that. Uh, then we spent a couple days uh, looking at all the evidence that Charles Darwin used to um, kind of support this theory of evolution. Um, that evidence, you know, included homologous structures, fossils, vestigial organs, um, and of course molecular homologies like DNA and uh, proteins. Uh, the last time, the last real assignment that we did was the genetics of evolution. This is that frog thing, and hopefully, what you guys got out of that was uh, that. Uh, in order for us to evolve in our physical traits, there has to be a change in the gene pool, right? And so uh, when the environment and selection pressures are acting on uh, a population, what it's really doing is deciding which genes are the best ones to keep and which ones are the ones to kind of pass on. Um, so the next topic in the sequence is the topic of speciation. Um, and uh, speciation, uh, before we can talk about what that or how that works, we have to kind of come back to the word that you see in that word speciation, and that is the word species. Um, so the first question is, what is a species? Um, now, we're going to start and end with this picture here. Um, but here you see three animals that are pretty similar to each other. You're probably familiar with all of them. Uh, we have a donkey here on the, the left side, a mule in the middle, and a horse. And if you were to look at, at this from maybe just an external perspective, uh, you would probably think that they're related and you'd be right. Uh, but the question we want to get after today is, are they the same species? Um, and to do that, it's not really like a uh, some a decision you can make like with your with just a gut feeling. Uh, we do have some criteria that we use to decide whether or not they're members of the same species. So let's take a look at that. Uh, first of all, ooh, my point is out. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, so what is the definition of a species? Um, Here's the definition. It's a group of organisms living in the same area that have the ability to reproduce. Um, and when they reproduce, they have to make offspring that follow uh, two really important criteria. Um, and now the, all the points are there. Um, first is they have to be viable, which means that the offspring have to be able to survive. Uh, if they mate and they have a baby, but uh, that, a, that baby um, doesn't develop correctly or it can't digest food or um, you know, body parts don't work and it, it uh, makes it really easy for predators to kill them, that's not viable. To, they're not going to be members of the same species. Um, the other criteria is that uh, the offspring have to be fertile and that means that you have the ability to reproduce. Uh, fertile is the opposite of another word called sterile. Um, and so if an organism is, is sterile, that means that uh, something's not going right in their reproductive organs and they're not going to be able to uh, pass their genes on. So um, that's how we define a species. Also note just at, right here it says that they have to live in the same area too and that's going to be uh, a little more obvious when we start looking at the, the, the barriers uh, which are in a couple of slides. Uh, again I'm going to just remind you here I know I'm going kind of fast so if you need a sec just pause the video and go ahead and write this stuff down. Okay so um, if species um, can't reproduce, okay, they are what we call reproductively isolated. 
uh, isolation. We're all kind of familiar with that now. We're all kind of isolated from one another. We're separated, right, from uh, my house to your house. Uh, we're not crossing paths. Uh, and so reproductive isolation basically means that uh, the, the gametes, um, the sperm and the eggs that make offspring, that they are separated from each other. Um, and so if the genes can't combine to make offspring, um, then they can't be considered the same species. Uh, and there are a number of barriers that prevent them from doing this. Um, and so the way you think about barriers is they're almost kind of like a hurdle, right? If those of you guys that run track uh, know that it's way easier just to run your lap around the track if there's nothing in the way. Uh, but uh, if your PE teacher or you know the track coach puts uh, the hurdles there, uh, it's gonna it's gonna slow down your progress, right? And if you can't get over a hurdle, uh, well, I guess in real life you could just run through it. <laughs> um, but if it, in this case with reproductive isolation, if you can't get over that hurdle or that barrier, you can't move forward. And at that point, you're considered to be two different species. So here's kind of the the big picture of uh, how this works. Okay, uh, the barriers are kind of split into uh, prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. Uh, now you guys have seen a part of this word before. Does that anything stick out to you? Hopefully it's the word zygotic, right? Zygotic is referring to zygotes. And if you remember, zygotes are the cells that are made when a sperm and egg come together. So prezygotic and postzygotic literally just mean that these are barriers that are in place uh, coming up to the point where sperm and egg come and become one and become a zygote. And then postzygotic barriers are everything after that. Uh, and so here's a picture. It's, you know, I think this is from uh, uh, that YouTube channel, I can't remember what it's called right now, Amoeba Sisters maybe. Um, but uh, this is what I want you to think of in terms of prezygotic pre and postzygotic barriers, right? Here in the middle, um, in the, this, you have the zygote. Um, and everything that comes before that, that prevents the sperm and egg from coming together, is referred to as a prezygotic barrier. Once that zygote forms, then uh, there are, it doesn't guarantee you're gonna have a baby. Um, and so there are some other barriers, fewer barriers, um, but they are there that uh, you would have to overcome before you become the same species. Uh, I don't know what the heck this thing is. It's uh, some kind of hybrid of two animals. Now, um, this is kind of a cartoony way to look at it. This is the more technical way to look at it. I know you're looking at this like, holy cow, that's a lot. But here's just how I want you to think about it, okay? Here you have this uh, blue dot, that's one individual, and a orange dot, that's a different individual. They are going to run a race, right? Think, we talked about hurdles. Think about this as a racetrack. It kind of, we ran out of space here. So they're gonna go all the way to the right and then they're gonna continue here in uh, the green track. What's gonna happen is every time you see these arrows right here, that represents a barrier or a hurdle that they have to cross, okay? And the rule is this, if they can't move through every single one of these hurdles and get to the very end, this is the finish line, and you see those two words again, I know it's kind of small, but you see the words viable and fertile offspring. If they can't get to that point and make viable and fertile offspring, then they are not considered to be uh, same species, okay? Only if they cross all that will they be considered the same. Um, so. Where does the prezygotic and postzygotic thing happen? Well, we're looking for the word fertilization. You guys see it? Yeah, fertilization is right here. Uh, it's also kind of crossed over down here. So fertilization, that's the point where the sperm and egg come together uh, to make that zygote. So all these barriers that you see before fertilization, those are your prezygotic barriers. And then everything that comes after that point of fertilization, those are your postzygotic barriers. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to do today is just kind of uh, walk you through uh, these barriers, um, talk a little bit about what that means, give you some examples, um, and then I'll send you off to do your activity for today. So the first barrier, the first hurdle is something called geographic isolation. And when you think of geography, that's uh, all about space, right? Um, different countries, different areas. And so geographic isolation just means that you have these two species that are separated by space. Um, and what does that look like in nature? That could be that the fact that they're on different islands, right? We saw this in the Galapagos Islands um, where the finches were just physically separated from each other. They could be separated by the sides, uh, two sides of a river or a mountain range or on a different continent. Um, and it just kind of follows the saying, like, if you can't date, you can't mate, right? If, it, if the two organisms you can't be in the same place together, uh, there's no chance that they're gonna reproduce um, at all. Um, so a classic example of this 
are these guys. Um, these are squirrels that you would uh, find in the Grand Canyon. Now, if you're familiar with the Grand Canyon, it's split down the middle by the Colorado River into the East Rim and the West Rim. And, um, you know, what we know from geology is that back in the day, the two sides of the canyon used to be one. And so these squirrels would kind of run all over the place. They were one group, they were one species, they're all mating, right? Uh, but over time, as that river cuts the, the, the canyon and the canyon gets further and further apart, these two, that population of squirrels got split into two. And over time, they became more and more different from each other. Um, that now, if you took, you know, in 2020, if you took a squirrel from each side and you put them in the same room, they actually wouldn't recognize each other. They wouldn't really mate with each other. And they, they're at that point, they're geographically isolated. And that's why we consider them to be two different species. So that's geographic isolation. Okay, you got to be in the same room. You got to be able to date if you want to mate. Okay, next one. Temporal isolation. Uh, the word temporal, you see the word temp there, that looks like the word temporary, right? And so temporary means that it's for a short amount of time. So temporal uh, isn't actually ha doesn't have anything to do with the amount of time, it just refers to time. Um, so what we mean by this is in temporal isolation, two species are separated by their mating time, okay? Uh, and what that means is that these two individuals, they mate during different times, and that could be different seasons, it could be different um, you know, uh, for flowers, I'll give, I'll, I think I have a picture of flowers coming up, but some flowers are going to bloom in the spring, some are going to bloom in the summer, right? And you guys know by now that flowers reproduce by um, having their pollen from one flower land on the female part of another flower, right? And so if they're flowering at different times this, of the year, then the pollen, which contains the sperm, is never going to mix with the egg and they're going to be separated. Um, it could also be t difference in time of day. There's the flowers I was talking about. Um, here's the example. Uh, this is the, a spotted skunk, um, and uh, what's kind of interesting is there are, there's two species of spotted skunks. One's the western and one's the eastern. They're kind of geographically isolated, but even if they're in the same place and even if their habitats overlap, um, they actually don't mate together because uh, they mate in different um, times of the year. Okay, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but one is like late summer and another's uh, kind of early um, early fall. Um, so time of the year, different times of the day, if one mates during the nighttime, one mates in the day, they're never really going to hit it off. Uh, and in some cases, even years, right? Some species don't reproduce every year, and so their years have to kind of line up um, to be uh, the same species. So they, uh, again, just kind of walk you through the hurdles. The first hurdle was they had to be in the same place, okay? The second hurdle, this is all pre-zygotic, uh, is that they have to be able to mate at the same time. Now, what if they're in the same place and the same time? Does that automatically mean they're gonna hit it off? Well, not necessarily, because the next barrier, the next hurdle is behavioral isolation. And this one's kind of a fun one, uh, because uh, this one is all about rituals. Uh, behavioral isolation kicks in when uh, you have a difference in mating rituals. And I know that's kind of weird, uh, a weird word to use. Uh, I'm gonna turn the music off here because I'm gonna show you a video in a sec. Um, it's a weird word to use ritual, but uh, and when you go into the, the animal kingdom, there's a lot of different rituals that uh, organisms have, species have, to try to attract other mates, right? And uh, humans are definitely an example of that. You could probably think of some things we do, uh, rituals that we do to try to, you know, show someone we're interested in. Um, so these would be differences, you know, in the animal kingdom, we see a lot of different dances. Uh, we see songs being sung by birds or uh, chirps from an insect or croaking of frogs, uh, calls. Uh, there's a, a lot of different behaviors. And the idea with this is, you know, if one bird uh, is singing their song and they're like, <whistles> right? And then another bird sings a completely different song um, they're never, even if they look like each other, they're not going to recognize like, oh, that's the mating song, right? So you have to have the same ritual where they say, oh, I know that dance. I know that song. Let's get it on. Um, so that's behavioral isolation. Uh, and so here's kind of a cute example. These are the um, blue-footed boobies, um, and they actually are found on the Galapagos Islands. And the way that the, um, they attract the mate is the male uh, does this kind of high foot thing. You can't really see it in this picture, but they have really big bright blue feet and the male will kind of lift his feet up and down and that's the way to basically say, hey, I'm interested, uh, let's let's get it on. Um, now, there are uh, all kinds of different dances and rituals and I actually wanted you to see some of this. So um, I'm gonna have you watch this video clip um, about some birds in uh, New Guinea. 
Oh, hold on. Uh oh. Here's the problem, is I can't seem to get to the sound controls without, okay. You know what? I will have you watch this. I'll post this uh, down below, and you guys can watch it later. It's worth a watch if you haven't seen it before, uh, because on this island, there are these these birds. They're all called birds of paradise, but they're all a different species, and every species has like a different ritual or dance that they put on to attract mates, and uh, it's pretty funny. Like Some of them like it's you know one of them like they have to clean up really well like the if, if their house is dirty what i mean by that is like if there's if the female comes by and sees that there's twigs and there's leaves and other thing you know uh the, the 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 ground is like really dirty she won't even be interested so this guy like spends you know i don't know hours maybe uh picking apart every little leaf and stick and getting out of the way and getting it really clean and then does this little dance so it's pretty cute um video is only like a couple minutes long but uh, definitely check it out i'll put the, the link down below um so you can see that i gotta be more careful about that next time darn okay um moving on to the next uh barrier this is mechanical isolation and this one's uh gets a little x-rated it's kind of fun so let's go through this they're at the same place now they're mating at the same time. They maybe have similar behaviors where they're like, oh, I know that dance. I know that call. I'm interested. And so now you actually get your mating attempt. They try to mate. Okay. But mechanical isolation is a barrier because this is the result of morphological differences. Okay. That's like the scientific term for it. Now, morphological just means the shape of your body parts. Now, if you think about the body parts that go into uh, making a baby, I don't really need to say which parts. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can't, but this YouTube, you know, this is, uh, this, this is like on the record now. Um, but what that basically means is that the parts don't fit, right? And so um, almost every, actually every animal uses uh, uh, genitalia as a way to um, deliver the sperm to the eggs. And so if the parts don't fit, right, or the car doesn't fit the garage or the uh, keys don't fit the lock, you get the idea? If they don't fit, then there's no way to get the sperm to the egg. All right, and that would kind of just be like trying to get a, a square, what is this saying, a square uh, peg in a round hole or something. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's mechanical isolation. Um, and that, you know, definitely can keep species that are similar to each other uh, separate. Um, great example of this is uh, the whale, you know, all the different whale species. Um, they're all quite similar to each other, but uh, as you know, uh, the genitalia of whales can can vary quite a bit, and uh, some of them, the blue whale, has one of the biggest penises in the world, right? So um, for that reason, if uh, you know the, the the parts are too big um, and they don't even fit into a female of a different species, that's going to keep them uh, mechanically and therefore reproductively isolated, and that makes them two different species. Okay, now at this point, if they get over that hump. Um, pun not intended because there's humpback whales and it's mating. Uh, sorry, that's terrible. Um, if they get over that hump, then sperm and eggs come together, right? And this goes back to what we talked about earlier is at this point, we've, um, we've uh, overcome all these pre-zygotic barriers to make this one zygote now. Um, but there's still those post-zygotic barriers. Okay, and I'm just going to give you this, give you all this on one slide because it's it's pretty quick. Um, but again, just because you make the zygote, it does not mean that they're going to be the same species. And why is that? Because here are the post-zygotic barriers. Number one is reduced hybrid viability. Right? If they mate and they get pregnant and the baby hatches or is, uh, the mom gives birth to the baby, but the babies have a lower chance of survival. Remember, survival is a big part of evolution. Right? So if the babies die um, and they can't make it then they're still considered two different species because their viability, their survival has been reduced. The next one, you can probably, see, probably guess where this is going, is reduced hybrid fertility. If the babies themselves grow up and they can't have babies, um, then that's like the end of their genetic lineage, right? It's, a, it's an evolutionary dead end uh, and they can't uh, continue on with future generations. And that means that the two parents, even though the baby's born, even if it can survive, is not going to be considered uh, the same species. The last one is hybrid breakdown. Let's say that the first generation, the baby is born and it's it survives, it's viable, and it's actually fertile. It actually can get pregnant and it can have kids too. But if the future generations, the second, the third, and the fourth generations start to uh, get more feeble, right? They get more weak 
their, uh, their ability to survive goes down, or they become sterile over time, then again, it's a slower, but ultimately it's still a, an evolutionary dead end. Uh, and that's going to lead to them being different species. So at the very beginning of all this, I asked you, uh, what do you thought about horses, donkeys, and mules? Um, and here's the situation. If a, And I, I think a couple people, maybe in sixth period, asked about this. But if a horse and a donkey mate, what you get is the mule. Okay, I don't know if you can see the resemblance here. I think the mule looks a little more like a donkey. Now, the mules are very viable okay they're really strong they're really hardy they kind of have best of both worlds i don't know exactly what that means in the horse world but uh they definitely can survive but uh here when it comes to their fertility mules are always going to be sterile okay something's going on i don't know exactly what where the horse's genes and the donkey's genes are too different um and the the genes are too different that the reproductive organs and structures don't develop correctly and uh that makes the mule sterile so they're not considered the same species. Okay? Uh, horses and donkeys, separate species, and the mule, what we call a hybrid, uh, is not, uh, I don't know if it's actually a real species or not, but uh, it's not really recognized as a real species because in nature, right, this would never actually happen. We, we only get mules because humans mated the horses and donkeys together. Now, the last thing I want to finish with is you guys have seen this graph before, right? Uh, let me move my face a little bit. Um, and uh, this is what we talked about in the previous lesson about the different types of selection. Um, we did it with height. Here it's looking at fur color of different mice. And uh, we talked about directional, diversifying, and uh, stabilizing selection. And actually we called this disruptive selection. This is a different textbook than I, I use. Now the reason I want to point out this one is because out of these three, one of them can lead to splitting into two species. And which one is that? That's right, the one in the middle. That's the disruptive selection. The reason I want to point that out is because when, when species split into two, okay, let me move my face back down here, um, that is called divergence. And uh, I, don't, I haven't read the books, I haven't seen the movies, but I'm going to guess that in the movie Divergent, it has to do something with one group splitting into two. I don't know. I'm going to take a guess there. All right. Now, um, what does that mean? That means they no longer mate and reproduce, and that create, ends up creating two branches of descendants from their common ancestor, right? That's what it means to diverge. Is you start off as one and then you split into two. You can even say that, use that word to describe like a road that diverges and it splits off. Um, and coming back to the idea of common ancestry, right? That point where they split, you have this 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 uh, this individual, this species that used to be the one, and then it gives rise to the two. That is the common ancestor. And so when we take uh, a bunch of species and we look at how they're related and we look at when they diverge from each other and when they be they underwent the the process of speciation what you can end up is uh, creating a model to represent that called a phylogenetic tree uh, what that basically is is a family tree that shows how everybody is related and also shows uh, their common ancestor right it's really no different than if you looked at your own uh, family's family tree um, so here's the last slide uh, this is an example of a phylogenetic tree and um, you can see here that uh, kind of time-wise, here's the ancestors, there's the common ancestor, and then these are the present-day species. So A, B, C, D, and E, these are the ones that are around today, right? But the way we can represent how they're related is by uh, connecting them with these branches. And you can say every time you see that splitting, there is a divergence point right there. So we also call that a branch point, and then what comes off of it are these branches. Um, and then anytime you have a, 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 a branch point, what that represents is some common ancestor, right? And obviously, the ones that are more close to the present day, these are the more recent common ancestors. And then the ones back here, those are the more ancient common ancestors. Okay, so uh, that's kind of our lesson for today. Um, hopefully, you got all those notes. If you need, if I that was a little too fast, and you need to uh, go ahead and rewind and uh, you know, make sure you get down those notes. Um, tomorrow, we are going to do a little activity that uh, relates to um, this, um, and that we're actually going to, I'm going to have you make some phylogenetic trees. Um, so, uh, I'll have like a little short video clip. I promise a lot shorter than this one that just kind of goes over the instructions with you. And then you guys will spend a little bit of time making a tree like this, um, in your notebooks. Okay. Um, I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions, um, or feedback about the video, this is actually my first screencast ever. So, um, if, uh, there's any feedback or comments or you actually have questions uh, about something that I didn't go over, uh, just uh, hit 
not hit the subscribe, you already subscribed, uh, just comment <laughs> down below and uh, I will either reply or uh, do uh, address it during the live stream. Um, just for, uh, just to kind of follow up on something about the live streams, I know when we met last week, I talked about doing a live stream two days a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but uh, there's actually so much stuff, there's enough stuff, it's a good thing that I want to go over that um, I'm just going to do one live stream um, Per week and that's just going to be on Thursdays and the time depends on what period you are so make sure you check canvas and find out uh, what um, time you should be checking it okay so hope that's helpful um, and I will see you tomorrow have a good one